Hello everyone, welcome to this time lapse of a gouache painting that I call Hunter and Hunted. Um, this is done in a pentallic aqua journal with kind of a mishmash of different paints um, and brushes. I'll uh, put the full list of materials in the description. Here I'm starting out just doing a sketch with my Faber-Castell uh, pencils. Just kind of lightly sketching things in. I didn't really have much of a plan early on for this piece. I knew I wanted to use the full width of both pages of the sketchbook, which I've actually never done before. Um, I'm kind of resistant to that usually because I like to scan things in and have them look really like a, you know, like a finished product. Um, I was worried about the having a very visible seam right in the middle of this, but it's a sketchbook and I feel like I should just embrace that fact and experiment a little bit and just enjoy it. Um, I did eventually end up making a version of this that I used some Photoshop uh, stitching to uh, eliminate the seam just so I could get like a completed piece out of it. Um, but I'm trying to get a little less uptight about that kind of thing because uh, I don't think most people looking at the image really care that much. Um, so I had this vague image in my head of someone, a figure hiding behind a rock and a, a very large figure off in the distance, and I wanted to try to suggest a lot of space uh, uh, between that figure in the distance and the one up close. Um, since that's always something I'm trying to do, I'm really honestly pretty fixated on that. I like to um, show depth and like atmospheric effects a lot, and that's a hard thing to get really accurate uh, for me with physical paint. I have a much easier time doing it digitally, so I'm kind of always putting that into practice. It's a big part of doing landscapes and giving a real sense of distance to the piece. I try to do very light sketches. I don't tend to do a lot of detail here um, because I, I really like the painting to be spontaneous and I'm kind of lazy, so I don't, I don't enjoy uh, doing a whole lot of detail and then basically having to do all that detail all over again. Um, I decided that the figure was not going to have a gun early on. Uh, I'm just kind of less and less interested in guns as props uh, the older I get. Um, I just feel like there's not really an interesting story there, so I decided to give this character... Uh, she's got kind of like a... what almost looks like a tuning fork. I, I don't really know what it is, um, but I was thinking it was some kind of bit of scientific equipment. Uh, I see her as someone who was maybe a scientist and was surprised uh, by this very large creature that uh, she's never seen before off in the distance and isn't really sure what to do. As for the figure, I think it was probably inspired a lot. I was reading um, the comic Monstrous by uh, Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda uh, shortly before I did this, and I think that some of the images of these uh, ghostly gigantic gods that appear in that comic uh, definitely inspired this. Um, it ended up giving this kind of armadillo-looking appearance, which I uh, don't have an exact explanation for. I just thought it looked kind of cool, and I didn't want to show a lot of detail on the figure since it was far off in the distance, so I thought giving it a really unusual striking shape would help show that it was a creature and not just a part of the landscape. So once I had the basic composition down, uh, I started by applying a light wash to the, um, the entire two pages. I wanted to try to get rid of the uh, white of the paper as quickly as possible. So I'm mixing in some cadmium yellow with cadmium red, mostly red, uh, just a little touch of yellow. I try to be pretty even, although I end up with this kind of striped effect anyway. Um, honestly, this is not something I excel at, and it's one of the reasons I'm not great at uh, just plain watercolor. Uh, gouache, of course, will allow me to just keep going over this until I get it right. Uh, I'm using a half-inch flat brush here, which is one of my favorite brushes. It's uh, really nice for covering pretty large areas, and I say large, but this is not a huge sketchbook. But it's nice for covering comparatively large areas, but you can also get pretty good detail with it. The nice thing about flat brushes is you can use the edge to create straight lines, and you can use the corners to create little dots. I try to keep this light enough that I can still see the pencil underneath, which can be a little tricky because uh, I tend to do very, very light, or at least as light as possible. Uh, preliminary sketching on here. Um, but as you can see, the figure in the foreground is still pretty visible, and that's kind of the most important thing, since the landscape is uh, pretty organic. It's forgiving. I don't usually need to plan that out as much as I do human characters, uh, where if I don't get the drawing right initially, it's going to be very, very hard to fix it later. Now I'm doing some wet-on-wet -wet effects. I like to do this early on when I don't have a lot of paint on the paper yet. I can do these kind of watercolory sort of nice feathered, uh, somewhat unpredictable and organic looking effects, which are really great for clouds. 
Now I'm mixing up some gouache and water uh, in a container here, and I'm going to be using it in my airbrush. This piece, I used very little airbrush to do it, and I probably could have skipped this step entirely. It didn't really give me the effect I wanted. I was hoping to do a really nice kind of subtle gradation between um, the light at the horizon and the darker sky in the foreground and kind of carry that forward. I wanted originally this to be a very kind of um, foggy, uh, like heavy on the atmospheric haze sort of composition, and I ended up kind of reducing that as I went along. Gouache can work in airbrushes pretty well. I've only got this airbrush fairly recently, and I've still never used actual airbrush paint in it, so I don't know what I'm missing here. I'm probably doing a lot more work than I need to, but since I already had the gouache and I knew it would work in the airbrush, I decided to just try using it, and I've gotten some decent uh, paintings out of it so far. This is a dual action airbrush. Uh, it's an Iwata. Uh, I'm pretty fond of it so far, but I'm very new to this, and uh, I don't really know what I'm doing yet, to be honest. Um, in this case, part of the problem I had was that I, uh, I think I had too much water in the paint because, and probably the surface I was painting on was still too wet because I'm impatient. So um, I ended up kind of finding the paint was pooling a bit and not spreading evenly like I wanted it to. Um, this could also be partly due to the pressure, uh, setting the air pressure on the compressor is really important and I haven't quite gotten the knack down for that yet. So I'm still experimenting. Um, in this case, I ended up honestly painting over almost everything that the airbrush put down in the first place, so uh, it probably could have just been skipped entirely. So now I'm adding some burnt sienna uh, to my sort of cadmium red and yellow mixture, and I'm going to use that. I'm trying to use it very lightly um, in doing the, the landscape technique that I've been taught in the past, which is to uh, work from the background to the foreground, and ideally then you kind of have colors that are the closest to that horizon color when they're far away and they get gradually darker and more saturated as they get closer. The very brightest highlights should be in the foreground, but you want a sort of generally light background. It really gives the effect of things fading off into the distance. So I'm starting with some mountains in the back. I try to keep the top outline of the mountains pretty dark and have it gradually fade out as it gets lower. Um, since atmospheric haze kind of sits closer to the ground, uh, you will usually see this effect in like photos or, or in real life when looking at mountains. I'm from the Midwest, so I don't see a lot of mountains in person, but when I do, I uh, try to take a lot of visual notes. So I'm gradually mixing in a little bit more brown as I move forward, and now I'm uh, drawing the this sort of monstrous creature figure. We don't actually know if it's a monster. It could be totally harmless. I get the sense that the figure in the foreground, she has never seen this before and uh, is just kind of hiding out of an abundance of caution because she really doesn't know what it's going to do if it's going to do anything or even notice her. And just like with the mountains, I'm trying to keep the top um, and kind of back outline of it a little bit darker than the bottom part to give it that sense of scale. This is going to help show that it's a large thing that's off in the distance rather than just being closer to the, the viewer. Uh, now this part of the ground is much closer to the viewer, so it's quite a bit darker. At this point in the painting, I'm mostly thinking about sort of the silhouettes of the different parts of the image. I'm not too worried about detail yet. Now I'm starting to paint around the figure in the foreground, and in order to try to maintain that as much of the pencil sketch as I can, I'm just uh, avoiding painting over it entirely. Now I'm pulling out some Prussian blue. I'm going to be mixing that in with the brown uh, to create the darkest tones in the painting. I've heard for a long time that you really shouldn't ever try to use black paint if you can avoid it, um, and I usually try to stick to that rule. I find with gouache, sometimes, um, since it tends to dry a little bit light, at least in my experience, and partly because it has that matte finish so it doesn't get the glossiness of like acrylic or oil, uh, that you sometimes do end up, if you really want a striking dark paint uh, part of your painting, then you almost have to use black, but in this case I was able to get away with it partly because uh, it had a nice contrast with the, uh, the light background. So now I'm painting in the big shadow areas on the foreground rocks. And I'm just focusing on the shadows now, uh, trying as much as I can to define their shapes with those. It's really important early on to establish a strong light source. Um, this is something it took me a long time to learn, but if you can clearly and consistently uh, show where the light is coming from, then you can use shadows to define all of the shapes and it'll usually uh, 
result in a stronger composition than something with kind of flatter lighting and colors. I find with drawing rocks and boulders that um, keeping them more angular is almost always the way to make them more interesting looking. Uh, when I was younger uh, and I drew natural scenes, I almost always made the rocks very rounded and lumpy. Um, and they had this kind of just indistinctness to them. They weren't very striking. I find that in the best paintings and uh, natural photos I've seen, they're often like really driving up out of the ground. They almost look, uh, look kind of dynamic and alive that way. Now I'm starting to work on the lighter side of the rock where the light's hitting it uh, at a slight angle, uh, but pretty close to directly, so it's going to be a lot brighter than the shadowy part. So I'm mixing in some white paint here. Um, white paint, white gouache, I find is both my greatest ally and greatest foe when it comes to painting because it's, it's really nice and opaque, which is one of the great things about gouache, but with the opacity comes a, a consistency that is sometimes really hard to work with. It's much thicker and more resistant to getting wet than a lot of my other pigments. In fact, more so than any of them. And it dries a lot faster, so I have to work pretty quickly with it. It can be very easy if you're not careful to add too much water, and if you add too much water it looks like you're putting down this really nice opaque white on the page, but it's going to dry to almost nothing. So. That can be very frustrating. Uh, that was something that when I was first learning to use gouache, it took me a really long time to start to figure out. So now I'm going in and detailing the human figure um, using that mixture of blue and brown. Since the woman here is supposed to be very focal, I'm going to make her shadow areas as dark as possible and try to also give her some of the brightest highlights because uh, that kind of contrast will draw the eye towards her and make her easier to distinguish against the darkness of the rock behind her. So I know I said earlier that I was working from background to foreground, but clearly I, I break that rule quite a bit. Uh, originally the background wasn't supposed to have much detail at all, but it was looking really flat and boring, so I decided to start defining some clouds, some distant mountains a little bit better. I'm also lightening up the sky on the right side since that's where the light source is coming from, and currently the reflected light is a lot brighter than the sky itself, which doesn't make any sense. So now gradually I'm working in the uh, texture on the rocks in the foreground. I find that one of the things that tends to make my painting stronger is when I focus a lot of detail on a few areas and I keep other areas fairly free of detail, um, which is A, a lot less work, which is great than trying to detail everything, but B, it keeps your eye on a smaller number of things. Um, there's less competing for your attention, but you still sell that there's a lot of texture um, and detail to the different objects in the scene. We're jumping ahead in time here. You may notice all the paint has vanished from my palette, which is actually just a plastic plate that I don't use anymore. It was actually good getting a little, getting that little bit of a break and being able to come back to the painting when it wasn't quite done because I already knew some of the things I needed to change. So like with most of the other things in this painting, I approach the face the same way. I'll start with a a base color, and then I'll do the shadows after that, in this case by once again mixing blue with brown, and then I'm going to do some highlights after that. This is about as small as I can paint a face and still make it look like a face, I find. Anything smaller than that and you would basically just have one blob of color and you'd have to use your imagination, so I wanted her expression to sell that she was intimidated but not terrified. She's ready to fight back if she needs to defend herself, but right now she's also kind of curious. There's, there's a lot going on there. I, I don't think that what I actually painted does sell all of that emotion, but it's what I had in mind while I was painting her face. I often find myself holding my breath when I paint things this small. Um, keeps my, my uh, hand from doing anything unpredictable um, because it's pretty hard to have control when you're painting this small. I'm starting to add more detail here to the, uh, the not as distant hill. Um, I knew it needed to be a little bit darker than it was because you kind of can't see it at all and I wanted it to be clear that it was there and closer than the, the mountains and the figure. Um, so rather than cover the entire thing in a darker layer, I just decided to start adding darker details 
um, since there's a lot more going on with the topography on the left side than the right side, which is intentional. I wanted the figure to really stand out, but uh, I can't just have nothing over there. It's going to make things look unbalanced and weird. This is where um, physical painting can be a lot of fun, is doing sort of natural shapes like this, because I can just kind of lightly drag the brush over the paper, and it will sort of create organic shapes for me. I don't have to necessarily think about exactly what's going to look right. This is why I love painting landscapes, uh, because they're very forgiving that way. That can be a lot harder to accomplish when you're working digitally, and you have to be a little bit more uh, exacting. So I found as I made the right side darker, the left side was starting to feel a little unbalanced, so I'm starting to add more uh, darker shadows on the mountains and the clouds on the left side. Now earlier I just kind of had been hinting at the uh, detail areas on the rocks, now I'm really going in for it to really define them with uh, some of my darkest values here. And now I noticed that there was not nearly enough yellow on the horizon to explain um, the yellow cast on the rocks in the foreground. So I'm going back over with some color. The same cadmium yellow I was using earlier, so it'll match. And I'm letting the yellow blend into the figure a little bit, so there's a slight kind of flare effect. So now I'm getting to my absolute favorite part of the painting, where I take a small brush and I put some very light paint on it, and I start working on the actual highlights. Um, the high, high highlights, the very lightest parts of the painting. This is where everything really finally starts to come together, I find. That up until this point everything was starting to look good, but there's something a little bit missing. You didn't quite have that three-dimensional feel to the objects that you want. And I've heard before that you should always save the highlights for last, that they're kind of like the dessert. They really, um, and they really do feel like that. I don't know, this is this is just really fun for me because it's almost like magic. Everything suddenly looks so much better. It just pops off the page. But you have to use them responsibly. <laughs> if you uh, if you just start throwing highlights everywhere, the eye is going to be drawn all over the place because the eye will always be drawn to the areas with the greatest contrast, I find. And so, I, as you can see, I'm putting a lot more highlights on the rocks in the foreground than in the background. I'm kind of cheating here a bit. You'll notice I'm starting to draw a highlight on her left arm in a place where, given where she is in the shadow of the rock, it doesn't quite make sense that the light is able to wrap around in the way it's doing. But even if it's not 100% realistic, I needed something there to really set her apart from the background. So I'm willing to take a little artistic license there if it makes for a stronger composition. And here I'm drawing some extra highlights on the rock around the area where the tuning fork thing is glowing. Uh, because those would be reflecting the light. I find these little tiny interactions of light um, around light sources really, really help sell that they're physically there in the space. And at this point it's just a matter of adding a few extra reflections, a few little details here and there, and I'm feeling pretty much done. Although you, it's hard to tell on the time lapse, um, I'm taking a lot of time here to kind of stand up, walk back a few feet, squint at the uh, painting. Sometimes I'll turn it upside down too. I find this is really helpful to kind of give you, let you see it with fresh eyes and show you sort of where things like, uh, you know, the balance of values is a little bit off. And with that, the painting is complete. So thank you for watching. I hope this video has been uh, instructive for people and uh, interesting. And if you have any questions about any of the techniques I've used or any of the materials, uh, feel free to leave a comment. I'm planning on doing more of these in the future, so stay tuned. Thanks very much.